Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Alrighty, folks, it is Shay here, and I have another great first generation cattle producer story. So we are visiting with Zach Lindsley, and he is going to share how he and his wife and their kids um, are building the operation that fits the lifestyle they want in Nebraska. And so what I really enjoyed about this conversation with Zach is that he was just incredibly honest about how they vetted through the mounds of information that is out there when it comes to farming and ranching and feeding and marketing cattle, as well as vetting through technology in which programs are going to give you the best ROI. He shares how he found people he viewed as successful and picked out those traits he wanted to also kind of mimic or that he found beneficial and knew would help him create a successful operation. We talk about how they freed up time with different technologies and strategies and really the impact of having a business mindset and knowing your numbers and not just finance numbers, but even uh, performance numbers. So with that, we are going to visit with Zach. Now, before we dive into that conversation, I do want to remind you that the best way to support a podcast is to give a rating and review on your favorite listening app. When you give a rating and review, it helps other people find this show in the Apple Podcasts and Spotify algorithms. So I would greatly appreciate that. It's free and it only takes a few seconds. Do that for your other podcasts you listen to too. With that, here's Zach. Alrighty, Zach. Well, it is a pleasure to have you on the podcast today to talk and learn more about your operation and some of the technology that you use. But before we dive into that, I would love to hear more about your operation in general. So for myself and those listening, can you just kind of give a little bit of a description of what all you've got going on? Yeah. So I am a first generation um, farmer slash uh, feedlot owner. I uh, <clears throat> met my wife in college and her dad was kind of a had an operation in place and gave us the opportunity to come back and, and take it over. And we started that in 2015. And then now we currently um, farm all the ground and then we own the feedlot now. Um, when I got started, we uh, were just doing row crop and we had, you know, 50 head of pair cat, cow calf. And then um, we had the, the small feedlot, 1,000 head feedlot, but we were only running maybe four or 500 head capacity, not too much. Um, in that time frame, in the last, since 2015, um, I've expanded up to uh, almost 2,000 head in uh, that time frame. And we're not all at our operation now. Um, we are um, using a couple neighbors' places and a couple custom feed yards to attain that number, but uh, it's been kind of a fun growing process, I guess. <laughs> so, Talk about kind of that start as being first generation. What were some of those main challenges you remember when you think back to those beginning yeah. years? You know, I did, uh, when I first got into the industry, uh, my father-in-law is, is kind of getting up there in age. Uh, when we first came back, he was in his 60s, and his health wasn't exactly the greatest. Uh, he had has dementia, and um, so it was kind of playing effect with his ability to be out here daily to help teach me and guide me on things. So I had to do a lot of research on my own. You know, he obviously had the old, well, you do it this way, but no reason behind it. Kind of the old grandpa dad mentality. Well, we've done it this way. This is how you're going to do it. And I never really liked that approach. So I did a lot of research when I got into it. I read a lot of books and I'd read a lot of articles um, just all over the board to try and diverse myself into what I was doing, why we're doing it, you know, is there a better way to do it? And uh, it's just kind of kind of grown from there, I guess. Um, some of the really big challenges, though, were learning the industries in general, you know, how to market grain, how to buy cattle correctly, how to uh, sell your cattle correctly, you know, knowing just the 
the day-to-day -day stuff and figuring out the numbers was a really big challenge when I first got started. So that that's really cool, and I always love to see people who take that initiative to go do their own research and sort through some of those <clears throat> different ideas and practices that might work for them or might not work for them. But with that, especially as a first generation, how did you kind of vet through some of those ideas for marketing and production? Because it can almost be overwhelming, the amount of opinions and even was, uh, out there. It was, uh, it was quite overwhelming, to, to say the least, because you would read one article that would say, you know, uh, I don't even know what to talk about there, but... You'd read an article that might say one thing, and then you'd read another article that would contradict the first one. And then so you were kind of lost at what you would do. So as I got into the industry more, um, I would, you know, I would go out and I would talk to other guys and, hey, what are you doing or what's your thoughts on this? And just kind of feel them out a little bit because obviously there is a lot of guys have been doing this their whole life. And there is some very good, uh, you know, vast information with these guys generational farmers before me so they do know what works and what doesn't work and and some of them are very good at elaborating why you want to do certain things or things to look for and uh, it really helped out a lot there too have any of those mentors stuck with you from beginning through now you know i uh my one mentor that um so prior to this my my folks were divorced and my dad worked for a um, gentleman uh, in western Nebraska and he owned a feedlot and I when my dad worked with him I, I got to become very close with the family and him and when I got the opportunity my dad passed away in 2014 the year prior before we came back and started with my father-in-law um, but during that time frame uh, Reggie was his name he was a mentor to me and we would talk about cattle and things like that and he kind of helped me, he kept me in the right mind for the first couple of years. And then unfortunately, he passed away um, to brain cancer, um, 2020, I think it was. So, but I miss having him around, but he did give me a lot of great information. And um, now I've kind of turned into the point to where I get phone calls from guys on cattle and stuff asking questions and so it's kind of been a big flip-flop from where I was, but it's kind of a fun, been a fun process. That's that's really cool when the table kind of turns like that and you get yeah. to help <laughs> the incomers. Um, so why agriculture? Because it's kind of, in my, I mean, I'm a fifth generation, so I guess it's always been there as an option for me, something I grew up very heavily in, but... I always kind of wonder with first generation why agriculture because to me if you're not used to it it might seem kind of intimidating to really enter into so what really inspired you to dive in well i was never scared of working <laughs> so long hours and hard work that never bothered me and i actually enjoyed the challenges of, of being tested daily or trying to grow the operation um, I always really enjoyed that aspect. And some of the most alluring part of it, though, I think, was um, I met a lot of farmers in my life that were successful. They were, they were very successful, but yet they were very grounded. And they had great families. They were living a very nice, comfortable lifestyle. And I really appreciated what I was seeing... Um, seeing them become, I guess, or the way they're living and the way they're going about life. It was just very alluring to me and my wife. And uh, we knew that it was just going to be the right fit for us and that it might financially provide us for what we're looking for, but also it was going to provide us um, that lifestyle that we wanted, that close family lifestyle. And, you know, that's, you don't get a lot of that anymore with the jobs nowadays. So, to have our kids a part of it, like I said, my this morning me and my daughter are out riding pins. She's eight years old. Uh, she's on a four-wheeler helping me check cattle. You know, I mean, there's just no other industry in the world where your family can be a part of you and a part of the day-to-day -day stuff like that. So, yeah. Absolutely. 
I think about all the extra time I got to spend with my grandpa because, and, and my parents and sister and aunts and uncles because we were all involved in agriculture. So it's really a great way of life. Now, you said you saw people who were successful and yep. you also looked at their lifestyle. What is that definition of success? Because a successful operation could mean different things to different people. So right. what's yours? That's, that's a good question. Obviously, when everybody thinks success, they think money. You know, they think you got the nice cars, you got the big houses. Like, that's everyone's first impression of success. Um, and don't get me wrong, that's great. I grew up with a lifestyle where we didn't have money. My family was pretty broke <laughs> my whole entire life. I lived in a single mom home. Um, times were tough. Mom worked three jobs growing up, you know. So the success part that I seen was the family orientation and the friendships and the camaraderie that was built in the community also. You know, there's so many people around here that if something happened, I can call, they'd be here in 20 minutes to help us out. And that lifestyle and the closeness that comes with being in the ag industry is just, is amazing. And I, and I love it for our kids to grow up in it. And I love for our kids to blossom and meet all these other younger generations, you know, coming up that'll be a part of this also. So hope that answered it. <laughs> yeah, no, I like that. That's, that's a amazing definition of success for, um, the, a cattle business. Um, so you brought up that these people were grounded. Um, and that was one thing you really noticed about them. But as you began looking at these successful farmers and yourself, what were some of those key things they were doing that you were like, yes, that is part of getting to where I want to be? Yeah, some of the some of the biggest things I noticed was um, some of these guys were taking a very strong approach on the numbers side. Like they knew you could ask them that day and they'll tell you exactly what their break even was. They'll tell you exactly what their cost of equipment was to farm a thousand acres, or they knew exactly what it was going to cost to turn that pen of steers 300 days from today. I mean, they just really understood the financial side of how to run a business and they treated it like a full blown business and not just, this isn't just our life. We have to do it. They were changing it into something where if we're not making money doing this, or this doesn't make sense, we either need to change something to make it better and more efficient, or we need to step back and reassess how we're doing things. And, uh, I really like that approach to what they're doing. A lot of these guys that I've talked to and met over the years, and we try to implement that into our day-to-day -day stuff um, on cattle and the row crop side also. It was So what I'm kind of hearing, and correct me if I'm wrong, almost like running it like that business gave them the desired lifestyle component. Yes, well. yes. They were they're very keen on how they do their day-to-day -day stuff. Um, the financial side, obviously, is a, a very important factor in this industry. Um, I mean, you go out and spend money all day long and buy cattle, but is it going to make you money, you know? <laughs> so uh, definitely understanding input costs and and the, the actual numbers to do things is very, very important in this industry. So what are some things you do to track those inputs, be on top of your finances, all of those things, because there are so many tools out there today for yep. us compared to generations before us. So can you talk about some of those tools and methods that help you? Yeah. So when we first got into this, um, the very first things that we were doing, like we didn't track anything. Uh, my father-in-law was su successful and uh, he would just at the end of the year, they made money. They made money. It was a good year. You know, that was kind of the mentality. Um, or I watched uh, when I came into it in 2014, the cattle market was on a, going up pretty high. And then right after that, 15, 16 fell off pretty good. And he was still thinking he made money. He didn't know co break-even costs or nothing. And I was like, 
I think he lost money, but, you know, we go back and forth. And that was really an eye-opening deal to where I realized that if we were going to stay in the cattle market, we needed to transition into being able to track these pins and these closeouts and monitoring exactly what it's costing us to do this and see if we're actually making money on these on these cattle or if we're just wasting our time and our energy to lose 50, 100 bucks a head, you know. Um, so one of the biggest things I looked into was software programs, um, feed software programs. Uh, one of the very first ones I got into was an Excel-based one. And, you know, that did a, it did its job of tracking what we fed per day. There's a lot more back-end uh, Excel spreadsheet stuff that I had to do to, to make it really give me some good numbers. Um, and then as we went forward, um, Performance Beef kind of gained some popularity. And I looked at this system, the iPad-based system, and uh, it was a no-brainer when I could see those day-to-day -day functions and the analytics that we could see on our closeouts and stuff like that. Um, that was very, I don't know how to describe it, a very pivotal moment for our operation when we switched over to that. And uh, honestly, I think it gave us a lot of buying power uh, and a lot of knowledge on what we actually could do you know maybe we we're doing things better than we realized and that maybe we could go out and buy that little nicer pen of heifers or steers and uh because we actually can make those pencil out pretty good so um having all that information gives you a lot of power on your day-to-day -day stuff it, it, it's impressive how much we can track so what would you say the biggest difference was from you know, the year before you implemented Performance Beef to now that you've, or from when you, till you started using it, we'll do that. So, what so was like the year prior, you're saying the year prior? Yeah, like what were the impacts on your operation? What were some of those big differences? I mean, you've kind of talked about it a little bit, but can you share yeah. a few more specifics if you don't mind? Some of the deals that we noticed is when we got into it, um, so this is kind of just some fun background information that we would track you know obviously we we're tracking on the closeouts i should say prior to performance beef you know obviously we didn't know anything we didn't know closeouts we didn't really know rate of gains feed efficiency anything like that it was kind of just a shot in the dark of what we were doing once we started implementing performance beef into the operation you know we could obviously see a real life data of what we were doing but some of the fun things that you don't realize though, and that I noticed is that when we got rid of some of our drive-in yards and went to um, feed bunks and concrete aprons, the efficiency would go up there. Or we started looking at like our timing efficiency of being able to feed that pin of cattle correctly. You know, we're able to start tracking that. And it, it was quite impressive to see just on a day-to-day -day deal, how off I might be feeding the pen of cattle because I overload or underload or um, being able to go back and say, hey, these guys were actually consuming 20 pounds of dry matter. Why are they so far behind these other pens? You know, it, it really allowed us to just take a, a deeper dive into what was going on on a day-to-day -day basis and being able to come back and look at it and say, oh, well, maybe that was the problem or did I cause that problem? It was just a real eye-opening deal and, and gave us a lot of freedom in making some good uh, management decisions. So, Well, thank you for sharing some of those specifics. Now, when you are approached by someone or come across a new technology of any kind that might have an application on your operation, what does that vetting process look like for you to determine, you know, is this going to have the ROI I want and need? Is it worth investing in? Right. So some of the biggest things I look at, obviously cost is a huge determining factor on everything. Um, if it's too expensive to get a good ROI, what's the point? Um, so that was probably the number one deal. The The number two thing that we're looking at when when new technologies are coming out is efficiency you know is this actually going to make me more efficient on our day-to-day -day stuff or is this just going to kind of put a band-aid on it and not really accomplish what we want and then the third thing to be um, ease of use you know is this going to be easy is this going to be something that whatever it is 
like if I'm gone, can I walk somebody through how to feed that cat that, you know, feed some cattle, make changes, you know, that's, that was a big thing. Um, or is this really going to screw up if I got some temporary help coming in? Am I going to have to spend a whole day to teach them how to use these technologies that we're using? Or am I going to be able to say, hey, hit this button, hit that button, and just go, and, and we'll talk about it later? You know, so that I'd say that's probably kind of the three biggest things that, that we look at. Okay. So are there other technologies that you've implemented that um, either independent or separate of performance beef that you're utilizing today? Yeah, so one of the other um, companies that I use big, obviously cattle is our kind of our main thing over row crop. Um, one of the other companies I use is Balance Forward. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of them. But you probably have. So I joined Balance Forward three years ago on the marketing side um, and had to, again, city boy, never learned anything agriculture. I remember when I came into this, I didn't even know what what a basis was. I had no idea how bases even worked. <laughs> so I've come a long ways and uh, had to learn marketing, hedging, options, trading, all sorts of things. And uh, so I partnered up with Balance Ford a couple of years ago um, as far as the, um, oh, what do you want to call it? Kind of the market outlook side. Uh, they helped give me some direction there. So we use that for our, our finance or our hedging side, uh, marketing side, and then combine that with our performance beef side uh, really gives us a great insight to what we can do um, financially and risk tolerance. You know, with these markets where they are, it's a, it's a very risky business being in agriculture, not just for us. I mean, for the whole industry, you know, we, we rely on guys and a city will never meet and they can screw it up real bad for us in a couple weeks or a couple months because they're just trying to make money off the board. You know what I mean? So it's kind of a, it really was eye-opening to to learn the markets and how futures trading and things like that. It is a little, it, it can be a little wild when you just step back and look at the whole picture sometimes. Yeah. So it sounds like you've really built out a team where you know what, you're good at, you know where you want help in certain areas to reach success. Yep. Yep. I've, uh, I've, I've learned over the years when I got into this, I mean, we were working 70, 80 hours a week, pretty easy. You know, it, it's very easy to work that hard in this business. And I learned as I kept doing it that nowadays it's not how many hours we put in to make us successful. It's what we do within those hours that are going to determine the next six months or even the next year of profits or losses. And so when I was able to free up the time, like just track and feed inventory or not having to watch the markets every day to try and make a decision based on what I think is going to happen because I have no idea what's going to happen, you know, that freed up that freed up a lot of time for me to then turn around and reinvest it back into the day-to-day -day stuff and to become more efficient here and there. And I think that's allowed us to be pretty prosperous in, in our growth. Um, and it's really helped take a lot of stress off when I'm not worried about my market plan or if I deviate from just certain things, you know, stress in this industry is a real deal. A very stressful industry. So being able to negate some of that, I think, is a, is very powerful for the individual, too, for like myself. It it helps and it gives me more freedom, time to hang out with my wife and kids and uh, to have fun with them. So in that process where once you got to the point where you could step back and look and say, these activities where I, if I spend my time in these areas, that's going to offer the best return on my investment, basically. It's going to yep. be better. Was there anything that you ended up cutting completely from the operation or stepping back from because you realized it was not as fruitful as maybe what you thought it was? Some of the things that I've given up in the last couple of years... <laughs> um, 
we started diving out into other uh, some other feedlots as far as like custom feeding. Uh, I was trying to do it all myself. I, I just uh, when I first got into this, I was like, "There's no way I'm going to give up the power of feeding these cattle. It's my cattle. I'll do it. Why would I pay somebody else to do that, right?" And then as time progressed, I was running myself crazy, and I was working a lot of hours, <laughs> and I was like, "There's got to be a better way." And so with the power of, uh, with performance beef. Um, we actually have cattle over at a neighbor's feedlot, and uh, we actually are running performance beef over there. So I'm actually able to track and watch everything over there and watch all my stuff. And I got cattle in a few other places too that we track everything off of. And it really allowed me to be comfortable with branching out and growing and knowing that I can actually see, again, a day-to-day -day or a monthly a uh, real life picture of where we're at and again that just took off the stress and and it allowed me to implement more of my time into the day-to-day -day stuff here uh, at our home place so so kind of an off question just out of curiosity do um, all the calves you're feeding out have EIDs that you're also pairing with performance beef or only some of them um, so yeah on so we did get in the EIDs a couple years ago um, and this last year I, I updated my, um, cattle working facility and I didn't get the readers back in place, but I still do run, uh, the animal health side of, uh, performance beef. It's, and I do like that because I do have a, um, a guy that comes back and helps me out from most of winter. And, uh, when we're full and we're running, you know, 1500 head, 1800 head of ball and calves in that October, November time frame we don't write down sick ones. So it's pretty nice when we can take those EIDs. If we do, uh, we treat one, we can put what we did, temps, all that. Mm -hmm. um, that's been a really nice feature. So if we are doing pin rides, pulled up on our phone, we can say, hey, that one's looking a little slow. Oh, we just treated that one two days ago. You know, he's still, he's still got 15 days or uh, seven days of medicine on board before we got to look at a second retreat. Um, that's been a really nice uh, addition with the ID tags and the animal health side of that, being able to track them individually. And then it's also kind of nice too, when you're weighing a pin and you can say, Oh, this guy, you know, he's actually, it's been 90 days. He's gone backwards. Maybe we need to pull him and reassess what's actually going on with this one. Or do we have gut health issues and or foot problems? You know, it's, it's just a nice little feature to, to kind of open your eyes up a little bit more. Does it, and I'm curious from the cow-calf perspective, does it make a difference at all to you if the cow-calf producer is also using EIDs and has any of that, maybe maybe those health records beforehand? You know, I don't think we're quite there yet in the industry to where I know they're talking about pushing EID tags for overseas sales and things like that. And I, I don't think it's a bad deal. I don't. I know there's more upfront cost to it, and guys are kind of like, you know, there's – they look at the negative side, but I do think there's some positive sides to it, especially um, if you do go to sell your herd or your your uh, fall calves or spring calf herd, whatever you got, and you do have that information, and you can hand me a book that says, hey, you know, 32A has been treated twice. We know that information. We know maybe we want to pull them or put them somewhere different, or I think there is some value to it. I just don't think we're there in the industry yet for for the guys to see it quite you know i think they're just looking at it as more as oh that's more work <laughs> i don't want to be yeah, trapped that just, down yeah and i i ask purely from the management standpoint of mm -hmm. you know the value there because i know everyone has their different opinions on and that, i have used performance beef uh we still do run some cow calf every once in a while uh, we have some pasture ground that we would just we'd buy, buy some, put them on there just for something to do in the spring, fall, and summer. And uh, we would utilize that on EID tags on the cows and calves. And that was that was actually, in my opinion, a nice feature. Uh, if I were to do full blown cow calf like that again, um, I think a system like that would be great as far as just trying to remember what you did and making notes on those individual critters uh, or cows, you know going lame or if they sloughed calf, you know, I think there's some great management decisions you can use with, 
with real life data like that. So I think it'll come up. Uh, some of that I think is there's still that older generation still around, you know, dad and grandpa still got a pretty good say. And, uh, they are a little scared to update with technology. You know, it just is what it is. They, they don't quite see the value in it yet, but, uh, the, my generation, you know, uh, they really see the value in the time savings. And I, I think in the next, you know, five, 10 years, stuff like that'll be everywhere. Absolutely. So, you know, you've talked about saving time and lifestyle several times in, during this conversation. So how do you, you and your family kind of spend your time in the community or elsewhere since Performance Beef and other technologies have helped give you some of that time back? Yeah, so uh, me and my wife, my wife stays home, takes care of the kids uh, full time and helps run everything else around here. Uh, couldn't do anything without her. <laughs> <laughs> our kids are crazy so um but the time savings that we have and, and the ability has allowed us to give back to our to our community um we both coach uh she coaches uh, volleyball and track and then i help out with track in the springtime and uh so we like to give back to the community and help out and we volunteer some other little deals here and there uh so it's a lot of fun and we allow it allows us to have our kids a part of things and gives us a little more time to hang out with them and go show them stuff or to see us be active in the community. And I, I think they'll feed off of that one of these days and it'll help them grow up to be hopefully successful. And, um, they'll be happy to give back to you because they've seen mom and dad do it their whole lives. So, well, that's awesome. And that's key to keeping rural communities thriving and, uh, staying strong. Well, Zach, do you have any final thoughts you want to share with the people listening? I, <laughs> um, I guess my biggest thing I would say is, you know, I hope this video reaches somebody who is maybe on the, on the verge of not quite sure what they want to do. They know they need to do something. All I would say is don't be scared. Oh, you know, try something different. And you might be surprised what it'll actually do for you, uh, whether it's the time savings, the return on investment, or just a little bit better know-how what you're doing. I, I would just say, don't be scared. Take a leap. <laughs> I've been doing it for 10 years and it's been working out and there's still days I don't know what I'm doing. So. All right. Well, I appreciate your honesty and you sharing your story and for being a guest on my show. Yeah, thank, thank you so much for reaching out to me. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. I want to give a big thank you to Zach for being so open and honest about his experiences and kind of the ups and downs of being a first-generation family in agriculture. Now, remember that if you want to learn more about Performance Beef, head to the link in the show notes. I've got their website there. Additionally, if you want more cattle information sent to your inbox every week for free, that's straight and to the point, won't take much time at all, but keeps you up to date on what's happening in the industry and on the podcast, be sure to head to my website and subscribe to my newsletter. Happy ranching, folks.